family business. His daughter, Ella, worked at the restaurant, and uh, so did his two sons. Um, they learned, the sons learned to cater food and wait the tables, and later they waited on the railroad dining cars. Mm. His friends and family talked about him as a great cook. Uh, Fanny Bowles Leach wrote, how I remember his homemade ice cream and the best vegetable soup I ever had. So there's a family life that takes place quite apart from his relationship with the white people and the customers. He has a family life, and we're so blessed to have these sources that tell us about that, right? It's not only the student point of view, but his family tells us they loved him, they, and they have very rich memories of him and his cooking. We also have newspaper articles that tell us that he was an ice cream vendor. He would, he would go to the military exercises at the Albemarle County Court Fairgrounds. The crowd cleaned up the ice cream and chicken that was sale, for sale by Mr. Bullock. <laughs> he was a steward at the summer resorts. We know a lot about that. I've, I've been reading a lot on the preservers' sites about, and other, uh, about the history of, the, of African Americans who worked at the resorts. He was one of them. And he happened to be away from home in the mountains when, when Peter Fawcett came back to town, which is really unfortunate. Uh, the man who taught him to read and write came back here, but he was working in the mountains at the time. He was a real estate investor and broker. And, and this is really easily documented, incredibly um, important part of the story. Um, He's able to secure a number of properties, which, and sometimes he did this for others, for relatives. And uh, we, I can document many cases of, of, the, of the property that he built, bought for himself or sold to others. These are just a few examples. Will's old ice pond. This is near Vinegar Hill, or in Vinegar Hill. Um, here's one he bought, he built a house on the lot and sold it to William Wills at the price of 400. Lot number 15, he purchased this property at public auction for $78. This is before the imposition of uh, uh, Jim Crow no. residential segregation. It's before we see the widespread practice of uh, covenants, as Jordy Yeager was talking about the other day at the Cultural Landscapes Workshop. Um, you could go to a public auction and buy property without being denied on the basis of race. And mm. many African Americans in this period take advantage of that. They buy a lot of property at, pro at public auction. Um, Here's one, he took this property off the hands of Oberdorfer who purchased it in a public auction and then sold it. So he's flipping these properties, um, selling them, not always for necessarily big profit, but I think he's sort of an intermediary for African Americans he knew. Mm -hmm. He knew how to do this. And I, I see this as the precursor to, um, to what he's going to do on a larger scale with the Piedmont group. And I do have some examples of him doing this for friends and family. I won't go into detail because I want to get to this. His success as a financier for friends and family, I think, may have led him and other, working with others to conceive of a more broadly collaborative venture to promote property ownership among African Americans here in central Virginia. In April of 1889, remember he hadn't been there very long. Uh, April 89, hadn't been in Charlottesville very long. He joins with eight other African American businessmen from Charlottesville to form the Piedmont Industrial and Land Improvement Company a joint stock company chartered by the Commonwealth of Virginia. This is remarkable. And this is a, a, a handwritten uh, uh, facsimile, of the, um, facsimile of the handwritten charter. It's one of the first charters in the Charlottesville Charter Book. Mm. Among the objects of the Piedmont Company, to purchase, hold, lease, rent, improve, sell, exchange, develop, and otherwise deal in real estate, to buy and sell real estate on commission, and to extend aid and assistance, financial and otherwise, to persons of limited means in purchasing homes. 1889, a chartered company, African Americans, the company was authorized by state law to issue up to 100,000 in total stock with individual shares selling for $50 each. An investor could purchase one share in the company for $50, paid in monthly installments of $1. So it's affordable. It's affordable. Put, put aside a dollar a week. If you take one share in the company, the sales pitch goes, at the end of 50 months, you'll have $50, and all the $50 have accumulated. <clears throat> and this gets a lot of coverage in the Richmond Planet. And um, they talk about in the first month of operation, the company purchased 10 lots and 15 to 20 lots bordering on the new city. That may not, you know, I mean, maybe in the grand scheme of <coughs> things may not be equivalent to what the Charlottesville Land Company is doing, but it's of, of great importance to understand that African Americans are engaged in this and are trying to get their piece of this and, and to do it communally. 
Thus you see, Charlottesville is blooming, and with it blooms the only 